I want to talk to you today about the love of God. The love of God for you and for me and for all his children. And I want to do it in the context of receiving healing, whether it's spiritual healing or mental healing or emotional healing or physical healing. And of course, the love of God is not limited to that context, but that's the context in which I want to address it. And why do I want to do this? Well, it's been a concern for me for a long time. I've been involved from time to time in healing ministry and prayed for, for numerous people, as I'm sure you all have, uh, with the mystery of why people don't receive their healing. Some do, indeed, many do, but it's also true that many don't. And that can be very confusing. It can cause us to doubt God. It can cause us to doubt his word. We even get absurd theologies such as cessationism, which tells us that all these miracles that we see in the Bible finished with the apostles. There's not an ounce of scriptural support for that. Um, not an ounce. It is merely an excuse that has been sold into the body of Christ from the pit of hell in order to distract us from what Jesus secured for us at the cross. But we'll address that in more detail later on. This at the moment is just telling you what I'm about to do, uh, what I'm about to address and the purpose for which I'm addressing it. So our faith, our walk with the Lord, our obedience to God, our trust in him, our faith in him, our reaction to him, our response to his voice, are all conditioned, in my argument, by the degree to which we understand how much God loves us. Now, that can be a difficult concept. It could be difficult because uh, perhaps you didn't have a particularly loving father or within your own family, love was not something that was freely expressed. And perhaps as a child, you felt perhaps not loved as you deserved to be. Um, that could be one reason. Um, certainly in my own case, I have no doubt that my father loved me. But it, because he'd say so regularly, but he didn't actually express it in many practical terms. So, you know, I always had to have a secondhand bicycle. Um, I always had to have secondhand clothes. It wasn't that he couldn't afford it. It was just mean because that's how he had been conditioned. You know, we all, we are all the product of our, our nurturing. And those who nurture us are a product of their own nurturing. So I don't hold any resentment towards my father. I just understand now that he was a damaged soul, as indeed his parents were damaged, and my great-grandparents were damaged, and my great-great-grandparents were damaged. And as it is for me, so it is for you. And so we land up with the parents that God chose for us. Be in no doubt about that. Your parenting, however it came about, is exactly the bloodline that God chose for you. So we can, that's why the Lord says, honor your mother and father. You might not like them, but you must love them and honor them. And there is a difference. Now, why do, that's a slight divergence, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to address the fact that it can be hard for humans to experience the love of God. They believe it, but it's not real in their lives because there's so many, so many calloused hearts or whatever in the way. And so it's very hard for us to receive it. But there are ways through this. The Lord has given us a way. The Lord knows how damaged we are and he's given us the way and we'll get to that in due course. Okay. So how do we discover how loved we are? How do we learn about this love of God for us? How does he express it to us? And what can we learn from that? And how can we take it and run with it and be changed by it 
There's no point in just gaining uh, intellectual knowledge or uh, uh, intellectual or academic understanding. That's utterly pointless. Theology has been turned into a, uh, an academic subject. And, and in most cases, it's totally dead. It's as dead as dull as ditch water. And be wary what you read uh, uh, about what the theologians have said. All you need know is what God has said and what he's speaking to your heart, because the Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us, and therefore we can hear the voice of God. We do hear the voice of God, and we must learn to listen to that and to understand it and respond to it. Well, to continue, this is part one of, I think, a two or possibly three-part video series in which we'll be discussing God's love and how that impacts or should impact um, our healing when we're prayed for. But we'll get to that in due course. God's love for the human race is, is beyond anything we can understand and his love for his saved children is something special again. We must know that we're loved, each of us. God loves each of us and uh, he's in love with each one of us. God loves you and you and you and me and he's in love with each one of us it's extraordinary but that's what his word tells us we know that because the word used when describing God's love in the Greek is agape and that has a particular meaning and I don't want to go into a great discussion or teaching on the four types of love referred to in the New Testament, but I'll just quickly gloss over them so that you can uh, understand this. The, the, the lowest form of love is perhaps wrong to call it the lowest. Agape is definitely the highest form of love, but the other forms of love are, the first one is eros, and that's pretty self-explanatory. From that we get the word erotic, and it's, the, um, it's a romantic or passionate love that we feel one for another, typically uh, between married couples and courting couples. The next level of love is storga, and storga is um, familial affections, the, the, the sort of love that operates within the family, uh, between parents and children, and wider field between cousins and aunts and uncles. That's a particular type of love, and when you think about these things, um, if you had to think about them, which you don't because they're instinctive to us, you, you, you can recognize that there is a difference. Uh, the next level of love is philia, um, from which we get the word filial, or, uh, meaning brotherly. And, and that is the sort of love uh, that brothers and sisters in Christ feel towards one another, filial love. And then the highest form of love is agape love and that's the love that God expresses towards us it is utterly selfless and a sacrificial form of love we experience it in a lesser way in the love that we feel uh, towards our children um, particularly when they're very small and vulnerable and indeed husbands and wives do from time to time feel it towards one another but it's not there all the time because we are fallen. It should be there all the time, but it's not. But it is with God. God loves us with agape love, a total sacrificial love. Think if you can, I mean these analogies never really live up to their, their hope, but they do serve to teach us something. Uh, think about the love you had for your spouse when you first met him or her. Do you remember the early days of that heady love when you couldn't really sleep um, you were so madly in love and those feelings of just wanting the other person I mean, strip out the, the the erotic side of it and that feeling of just longing to be with that person all the time of wanting to give them their heart's desire were you able to do so that is agape love that is um, what we should experience when we are experiencing God's love for us. That's how much he loves us. He never sleeps nor slumbers. 
and you can imagine that part of that is because he just loves us so much that we keep him awake. Now, that's my interpretation. I'm not, you won't find that in scripture. I'm just trying to use a way to help you to understand how much God loves you. And from time to time, you might have experienced it. I've experienced it twice in my life for a short time, a very short time, but it is beyond anything um, I can describe really. That's how much God loves us. And it's, you know, if you, if you take that feeling that you had for your loved one, your husband, your wife, that special love, that longing, sacrificial love, which you experience for a short time because of course love matures into something else. But that loving and longing and desiring, multiply that beyond by the largest number you can think of. And that still won't be enough to express God's love for you. And God's love for you doesn't wax or wane, it's there all the time. So let's see what the scriptures say. Now in Hebrew, Agape in Greek, that's the Greek, the four Greek words for love. Uh, well, in the New Testament, of course, it's written in Greek. In the Old Testament, which is written largely in Hebrew, a little bit in Aramaic, but largely in Hebrew, the word is chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D. And that is God's everlasting love, his mercy, his it, everything about the way he interacts with you, his forgiveness, it's all based on his chesed love, his total self-sacrificial, all-consuming love. And this shouldn't surprise us because God is love. He is love. Um, the downside, no, that's, that's the wrong word, um, uh, contained within this love is the ability to chastise us because God chastises those he loves and it's not there to punish it's there to train and to lead us and to guide us into living a righteous life okay so it's time to look and see what the scriptures say what has the lord told us about his love for us um, it's normal to tell people that you love that you love them i mean that's perfectly normal and one would expect the lord to do exactly the same and indeed he does we're going to look first at jeremiah 31 verse 3 here we are, Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Now that is chesed. He, he has loved you with an everlasting love. This love for you is so steady and strong, never fading or waning. Uh, the psalmist writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Psalm 36 verse 7 how precious in your steadfast love O God the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings how precious is your steadfast love he doesn't change he's not capricious he doesn't uh, as you get up in the morning think I feel a bit indifferent towards you today young young Jane or, or or young Julia or young Robert I think I'm feeling a bit indifferent I'm a bit grumpy um, I'm going to give you the cold shoulder say but any part of anything else it'll shake you up and teach you not to take me for granted the Lord doesn't do that he's not like humans he loves you with an everlasting love and his love is steadfast towards you. He loves you in the way that um, he wants to take you under his wings. What does it say? The children of mankind, that's us, take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And think how little birds, little baby birds, little chickens, little ducklings, how they scurry to their mother and hide under her wings and she protects them. And this is just a picture language to show how the Lord protects us. The Lord, of course, doesn't have wings, but we, this, these are, are metaphors that we can understand because we can experience them in nature. And Romans 1 tells us how the Lord has revealed himself in nature. His characteristics are revealed through his natural expressions. And that's thrilling, don't you think? I do. I do because you can look at a chicken clucking around and her little chicks running to her and think 
That's how the Lord is with us. Now, the Lord continues in the New Testament to tell us how much he loves us, and that shouldn't surprise us because uh, the scripture tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he doesn't change. As I said earlier, he's not capricious. He's not moody. Um, he's totally just and righteous, and he loves us because that's his very nature. In Romans 5, 8, it tells us, but God has shown his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that extraordinary? You, there must be times in your family life, if you have children, when they were being particularly difficult, either as teenagers or whatever, when your love was sorely tested. Your love didn't break. But never mind, the ability to express that love in the moment was sorely tested. I'm sure most of you have experienced that, um, if not with your children, uh, in some way. Uh, we are tested. But it says that while we were still in that state of, uh, of tantrum, of rebellion, of disregard for the laws and, uh, that God has laid down for us, of total disrespect for the very person of God, while we were still in that state, it says, while we were still sinners, the scripture says, Christ died for us. And this was an expression of his love for us. Remember the scripture says, but God has shown his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's Romans 5 um, verse 8. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 5, it reads this way. But God, being rich in mercy, rich in mercy, think about that, because of the great love with which he has loved us. This was driving him. The love that he had for us is, 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 is a driver for God. And he goes on to say, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. God's grace, unlimited grace, informed by his overwhelming, overpowering love for each one of us. Even when we were being vile and disgusting and deplorable, in our characters and in our behavior. He loved us so much that he still leant down and touched us to save us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, the Lord loved you, dear viewer, loved every one of you and me. He loved us and continues to love us personally with a great love. And he demonstrated this love to us by giving us eternal life, giving us the gift of eternal life that we might spend eternity with him. He made us alive together with Christ. Quite extraordinary. And how did he do it? Well, John 3.16 tells us that, for God so loved the world, that is the whole world in its physical, spiritual, inhabited world, every single person in it, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now that's an appropriate point to take an aside. When I'm talking about believers, I'm talking about what the Bible calls, what Jesus calls someone who's born again. Now you might say, I don't know whether I'm born again. Well, this is the test. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Do you believe he came to earth to pay the price for your sin and to redeem you to eternal life? And do you believe that he died and was resurrected from the dead? If you believe that, you're born again and you are sure, absolutely sure of eternal life in Christ. If you don't believe it, then it's time to take stock and ask yourselves why you don't and come to the place where you can realize perhaps you weren't fully informed or understand and now is the time to ensure 
that you are born again. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he should, who should believe in him, who, or perhaps whosoever believes in him, should not perish. And that means go to hell, should not perish, but have eternal life. Now God the Father holds out his hands to you, he holds them out and says to each of you watching and to everyone, come my child, come. I have loved you with an everlasting love. My love is steadfast and sure. It doesn't wax or wane, and it's set before you in the gift of my son. And his death for your sin, that I have, I have redeemed you, perpetually redeemed you for myself. You are saved. You belong to me, and I love you. That is what God is saying. Saying to that through the scriptures, it's as clear as clear if you will read them and see it. You are so greatly loved, every one of you, and me too. You are, you are each one of infinite value and worth. You are exactly, exactly, each of you, exactly as God designed you to be. Do you know, talking about human conception, I, I, this is so important that you, you are exactly who God designed you to be. Now, you might have gone a bit wrong because of the fall, our fallen natures and everything else, but that's not the point. The point is that you, through your bloodline, through your parents, are exactly who God designed you and wanted you to be. He foreknew you and he formed you, it says, in your mother's womb. But what's extraordinary is what happens just prior to the point of conception. Now we've been told, because it supports the false theory of evolution, that, that in, for human conception, there's a big fight and the sperm race to get to the egg and the first one there's the winner. We now know that's not true. The egg, the female egg chooses the sperm, selects it. Now there's a lot more going on, but let me just keep it simple. This is the irreducible minimum of what goes on. The female egg chooses the sperm to fertilize it. And if there's no one there she wants, not gonna happen. Now, of course, there could be medical reasons for re people being unable to conceive. But uh, in, in the normal run of things, this is what happens. The egg chooses the sperm. It's not the survival of the fittest. It's the conception of God's ordained children. Every one of them, every person who's ever lived has been ordained this way. And so you can see how Adam and Eve, who had the whole human gene pool, and they passed it on through their children to subsequent generations. God has matched up the sperm of the man with the egg of the woman. And here we are today. Isn't that just wonderful? So you're greatly loved, you and me too, of infinite, of infinite value and worth to God because we're exactly what he designed us to be. Now God says one or two other wonderful, wonderful things about his love for us. And I hope the sound of that drill, or whatever it is in the background, is not too great. He says one or two other wonderful things about his love for us. In Zechariah 2, chapter 8, he says, he says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. God's protection for you is so great, there's nothing casual about it, that he says that he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And the side margin says pupil, touches the pupil. Well, just imagine that. You try to stick your finger in your eye, how painful it would be, and how you would make sure it didn't happen. But the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word that has been translated apple of eye, or, or indeed the pupil of the eye, carries a much more intimate meaning, and it suggests that um, you are so close to God, that he's so close to you, that you could see the, your reflection in the apple of his eye. And 
vice versa, that he could see his reflection in the apple of your eye. Now that's the ideal, but he, you might not, he might not see his reflection in your eye because you need a revelation of his love. But you can see your reflection in his eye because that is a fact. Isn't that wonderful? And also, as a sort of extension from that, he says to us in in um, Isaiah, Isaiah forty nine, Isaiah forty nine and verse sixteen, he says, "See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The Lord has inscribed us, your name." The name of each one of us, plus the collective name for us as the Bride of Christ or the Body of Christ, is engraved upon the palm of the Lord's hands. We're the apple of his eye and we're engraved on his hands. And taking these together, what it says is we are continually before him. Continually. There's no moment when he's not aware of us. There's no moment when he's not thinking of us. There's no moment when he's not concerned for us. There's no moment when he's not working in our lives to sanctify us, causing us to change from faith to faith and glory and glory into the likeness of his Son, which will be fulfilled and consummated, of course, at the day of the resurrection. So what are we going to do with these things? We need to know them. We need to know these facts. And a bit like Mary, when she was visited by the shepherds um, in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, she pondered these things in her heart. And I would encourage you to ponder these things in your heart. Um, I've told you these things. I've informed you of these things. But I'm acutely aware that information is not the same as revelation. In order for us to know that we're not, You've got the background knowledge now. But in order to know that you're loved, you need a revelation. And is that possible? Indeed, it is possible. The Lord has made a way. And if you turn to the book of Ephesians, we're going to look at Ephesians. Again, if you look at the prayer, well, there's two parts. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, and I've already quoted this scripture earlier on in this teaching, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, it reminds us, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Now, that's the background. If we jump from there to chapter 3, was, and there's this great prayer of Paul, um, and it's it's laid down in the form of a prayer, and we could we could pick. It starts at verse fourteen, Ephesians three, verse fourteen. For this reason, Paul writes, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, that's us. He would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Why? This is important. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The prayer goes on. But isn't that wonderful? You can pick out that prayer, write it out on a piece of paper and personalize it like this. But God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved me, even when I was dead in trespasses, made me alive together with Christ. By grace I have been saved. And I pray that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith, and that I, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width 
and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that I may be filled with all the fullness of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're praying for a revelation of the love of God in your life. And God is faithful. He will do it. That's the end of part one for now. That's the end of part one, telling you how much God loved you. And part two will be how do we take this knowledge and apply it to receiving healing in our lives from the Lord. I'll see you then.